Hello, this is the uh, second lecture for the course Computational Core of Social Cognition. And uh, for this lecture, we're going to discuss the article by Fisk and Haslam, The Four Basic Social Bonds, a presentation of Alan Page Fisk's Relational Models Theory. First, I'd like to begin with the review of the last class. Um, last time, uh, we covered how uh, particulate systems potentially lead to greater diversity, whereas, by contrast, blending systems tend toward sameness. And given the increasing diversity of social structures over time, a particulate system must enter into interpersonal cognition. Ah, there we are. Given the increasing diversity of social structures over time, a particular system must enter into uh, interpersonal cognition. Uh, the same sort of phenomenon was observed in the case of biology. In uh, evolutionary branching, you find greater diversity over time, just the opposite of what you would find in a blending system. So we know, even before the discovery of the double helix, we know that on some level, um, the principle of inheritance must be something particular, which indeed it is. In other words, discrete objects are combined in thought. In the case of cognition, it's thought, obviously. Discrete objects are combined in thought to form compound objects. Now, the brain, of course, <clears throat> only stores finite information. So the primes, that is the atomic units, of the particulate system for interpersonal cognition must be finite in number. There must be a finite number of primes. So what are the primes of interpersonal cognition? Now, um, the most plausible and scientifically corroborated answer we have for that question is the relational models theory proposed by the cognitive anthropologist at UCLA, Alan Page Fisk. Now, according to Fisk's relational models theory, there are four basic mental models, and these are universal for the species, and they are applied to all social relations. This is not to say that there are only four mental models used in interpersonal cognition. It's to say that there are four elementary mental models used in interpersonal cognition. In other words, for any model that you're using in structuring a social relation, that model can be analyzed into these four basic models. Of course, there are going to be compound models because, as we know, this is going to be a particulate system. The basic models are going to be like Lego blocks that you can attach together to form compound models. But basically and ultimately there are four basic ones according to relational models theory. Uh, quoting Fisk, each elementary model is a motivated schema for constituting social relationships. It's a guide, a plan, or a recipe and each model is also a model of what is happening in social relations. It's a model for understanding, a model that gives meaning to action. In other words, a model does two things. It motivates, and the other thing that it does is that it brings understanding. And here is what the four models are. One elementary model is known as communal sharing. Communal sharing is a relationship of equivalence in which all the people in some bounded group are considered the same for the social purposes in question. Now, in communal sharing, all members of the group are seen as sharing a common substance, and the members of the group are not differentiated. For social purposes, the members are not distinguished. Um, one example of such a common substance might be blood, uh, but it, it could 
in principle be almost anything. It could be land, right? Um, it could be a common history. It could be a common language. Sharing is the core concept in communal sharing, having something in common. In communal sharing, the needs of the group trump the needs of the individual. But this is not altruism. It's not perceived as altruism. And why isn't it? It's not perceived as altruism because the individual identifies with the group. The individual is the group. And so by helping the group, one is helping oneself. An insult to the group is an insult to oneself. An attack upon the group is, is an attack upon oneself. Now, here are some examples of communal sharing. Now, superficially, they're quite different from each other. But when you think about it, you'll find that at their core, they're fundamentally the same. Nationalism is an example of communal sharing. Romantic love, racism, indiscriminate killing of anyone outside of one's group in retaliation for an attack upon one's group. Decision-making, uh, when it is structured by communal sharing, it works by consensus and seeks unanimity, such as decision-making within the Quaker Church, for example. That's a good illustration of decision-making structured by communal sharing, because a decision is not accepted unless everyone accepts it. Um, in considering these examples of communal sharing, I'll note that in each case, there's a strong sense of having something in common. In nationalism, it's our ethnicity that we have in common, if it's ethnic nationalism. If it's state nationalism, then it's our citizenship, which we have in common. In the case of romantic love, it's our love, which we have in common. In the case of racism, it is, well, however one understands race. It's our blood that we have in common. It's our substance that we have in common. It's our skin color that we have in common, perhaps. Um, now, moral judgments can also be structured by communal sharing. In fact, any one of these models can structure moral judgment. When moral judgment is structured by communal sharing, um, one finds the view that people should share with other group members. Quoting Fisk again, in transactions, the group pools resources and operates on the principle that what is mine is yours. Okay, so that's one way for people to interact. Here's another way. Authority ranking. Now, in authority ranking, interaction is structured with respect to ordered differences. Either people or groups stand in a linear hierarchy. Now, basically, sets of people stand in a linear hierarchy. A set could contain as few as one person, or it, contain, it could contain indefinitely many people. So here we have a relationship of inequality. Subordinates are expected to respect and obey. Superiors enjoy greater prestige, while they also have duties of protection and care for their inferiors. So, a, a superior person expects to be respected, they expect to be honored, and when authority ranking is functioning in the way which intuitively it should be functioning, the superior person deserves the respect and they deserve the honor because they have certain duties of pastoral care for those who are beneath them. Okay. Superior people are also the ones who outline the social norms. They decide what is right and what is wrong. In authority ranking, initiative 
also comes from ab above. Um, decision making is made by a higher person for the benefit of those below. Once again, quoting Fisk, initiative often rests with the highest ranking person or people within a social relationship. And authority typically confers certain related prerogatives involving choice and preference. Examples of uh, authority ranking, I've, I've listed some here, are military rankings, ethnic rankings, um, ancestor worship, and monotheism. Now, the example of monotheism is, um, is interesting. It brings out a, an important point, namely that these models are psychological. So even if someone is an atheist, they would still acknowledge that monotheism is authority ranking. Because even though we're talking about social relations, ultimately we're talking about what happens inside someone's mind. It's thinking of someone as an authority which gives you authority ranking. Moving on to the next elementary model, equality matching. Equality matching relationships involve either maintaining or restoring balance or a one-to-one -one correspondence. And quoting from Fisk here, in fact, the, the quote is on the screen, shares of a given substance, turns, or things given in return for earlier help should balance or match precisely. In the same sense, persons in an equality matching relationship are treated as distinct but interchangeable with each other. Now, you'll note that it's this feature that distinguishes equality matching from communal sharing. Um, the first time I read about the four elementary models, I had some trouble distinguishing communal sharing from equality matching. I thought, well, aren't they just the same thing? Uh, the difference is that in communal sharing, everyone is one. All the members of the group are a single entity, at least psychologically, socially. We're all one. Equality matching is not like that. In equality matching, we're balanced, but we're still distinct people or distinct groups. The basic idea in equality matching is to maintain balance. Right? Um, the basic idea of communal sharing is that we're all one because we share something. So they are different. Well, examples of equality matching include equal time. For example, if there's a, a political debate, the various debaters will you know, expect equal time, expect to be given equal time. That's equality matching. Equal team size and rules for taking turns. And equality matching also has a negative side. Restitution in kind, um, tit for tat, uh, vengeance, that's also equality matching. Finally, the fourth and last elementary relational model is known as market pricing. Now, the core concept in market pricing is proportion. Interactions are conceived in terms of rates or ratios, such as prices, wages, interest, rents, tithes, or cost-benefit analyses. Quoting Fisk, again, um, people using this model, market pricing, they make decisions according to rational calculations of cost and benefit or supply and demand. As for example, when the market determines what commodities are produced, where, how, and by whom. Okay. Uh, market pricing can involve maximization or minimization, but it doesn't have to. Um, so if you're running a business and you're trying to maximize your profit, that is market pricing. If you're trying to minimize your loss, that's also market pricing because maximization and minimization are both ratios. However, 
maximization and minimization are not the only ratios, deciding upon a fair price for a commodity is also market pricing, even when maximization is not involved. Um, market pricing also applies to ethics. Utilitarianism, for example, is market pricing. Um, the maximization of utility. The basic utilitarian principle is to maximize goodness, whatever goodness is. And different utilitarians have different conceptions of what goodness is. So goodness may be pleasure, goodness may be the satisfaction of preferences, goodness may be happiness. Yeah. Um, the view that goodness should be maximized is a form of market pricing because maximization is a ratio. Negative utilitarianism is also market pricing. Negative utilitarianism is the view that suffering should be minimized. In other words, you aim for the ratio of 0%. Okay. Now, um, I don't want you to uh, assume that market pricing necessarily involves a market or that it necessarily involves capitalism, for example. Although capitalism certainly is market pricing, it's a special case of market pricing. It's not the whole of market pricing, but merely part of it. The judicial relation, the relation of judge and defendant or judge and plaintiff, that's also market pricing. On the face of it, that may be a little bit surprising, because on the face of it, you might think that that's authority ranking. And of course, you're right. It is authority ranking, because the judge exerts or exercises authority. However, there is also a component of market pricing. When the judge decides on a punishment or on a compensation, the punishment or compensation must be suitable. For example, the punishment must fit the crime. What that means is that the punishment must exhibit the right proportion. It must be proportional. That's market pricing, because the core concept in market pricing is proportion. Now, the fact that the relation between judge and plaintiff or judge and defendant um, illustrates both market pricing as well as authority ranking uh, illustrates a very important point, in fact, a central point for this course, namely that different models can be combined. It's the combination of models which shows interpersonal cognition to be a particulate system. In the case of the courtroom, the dominant model is authority ranking. Somehow that model predominates, and it's the first model that would come to mind if someone were to ask you what relational model structures the courtroom. Of course you would think authority ranking. However, there's a very important component of market pricing that is also present in the courtroom, and it's subordinate, at least intuitively, it's subordinate to authority ranking. Now, um, according to relational models theory, individuals use these models to understand, to anticipate, to guide, and respond to social interactions. And this is true not only on the large scale, it's true not only for huge social structures, such as states and economies, it's also true on the small scale. It's true for seemingly trivial or mundane interactions, such as buying coffee in a cafe, which is at least partly market pricing. The presence of the four models across diverse societies is no less remarkable than their ubiquity in both grand and minute social relations. So you find all four models not only structuring different societies, but also structuring 
relations within a society. And you find them on very different scales. The principle of one person, one vote is structured by equality matching. But the custom of waiting in line at the post office is also equality matching. The relation between the emperor and subject is authority ranking. But the custom of reserving coffee for grown-ups is also authority ranking. Every time that people choose to emphasize something that they have in common, that's communal sharing. Communal sharing structures the intense patriotism which would cause one to give up one's life for one's homeland. On the other hand, so, so that's something big, that's something dramatic, right? On the other hand, though, communal sharing also structures two people sharing a snack at least when there are no tabs kept as to how much each one of them eats. If two people share a snack and they don't keep track of how much you know, each one of them eats, that's communal sharing. They have something in common. They're sharing something. On the large scale, market pricing structures the economics of the marketplace. However, market structuring, market pricing also structures the decision of a parent in deciding the right amount of reward to give their child for some good deed. Right? Because that involves proportion. The models can be combined. We've already mentioned this a little bit. We've gone over it some uh, with regard to the courtroom. In the courtroom you find a combination of authority ranking and market pricing. And you also find one model taking precedence over the other. Authority ranking takes precedence, and market pricing is subordinate to it. Yeah. Uh, you can also find the reverse of that. You find the same two models combined um, in a, a restaurant where there are waiters waiting tables. The predominant model there, the overarching model, is market pricing because the customer is paying for a service. But it's also true that there's authority ranking. This is especially vivid if you imagine like a really fancy restaurant, like a, kind of a, a European style restaurant, right? And um, the waiter is behaving like a servant and the customer is behaving like the servant's, well, master, I suppose. <laughs> um, <clears throat> The waiter is behaving something like a butler, right? That's authority ranking. But it's authority ranking that's being paid for, and that's market pricing. And it would seem, at least intuitively, that the overarching model there is market pricing, the subordinate authority ranking. Now, another illustration of relational models being combined, which may also dissuade you from simply equating market pricing with capitalism is the uh, Marxist slogan from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Well, what relational model is that? Um, on a superordinate level, on an overarching level, it's communal sharing because the point of communism is communal sharing. That's why it's called communism. But if you consider that phrase, according to blank, that indicates a ratio. So that means that this is market pricing. Or, to speak more carefully, we have here a combination of communal sharing and market pricing, with the market pricing somehow being subordinate uh, or subservient to the overarching communal sharing. Now, let me see. Um, uh, so another example, uh, what do I have here on, on the board? Um, yeah, the example of the parent deciding the right amount of reward to give their child for some good deed. That, of course, is very similar to the case of the uh, judge in the courtroom. Um, 
even though the parent's decision is structured by market pricing, because the parent has to find a reward which is proportional to the good deed, the parent's right, the parent's prerogative, possibly even duty to make the decision, illustrates authority ranking. So authority ranking and market pricing are combined in this case. And this illustrates what I mean by a particulate system in interpersonal cognition. Um, it suggests that um, thinking about social relations, um, which exhibit even a modest degree of complexity, a computational operation is at work. And like I said earlier, I'm going to elaborate as we go along as to what I mean by computational. But for now, just think particulate system, self-diversifying particulate system, like the genetic code or um, Lego blocks being stuck together. I'll be a, a bit more specific later in, in the, uh, as the course goes along. Now, let's consider Ah, that's the point I just made, right? Uh, the, combinatorial, the combinatorial property of the models is our main concern in this course, and uh, this property suggests that relational cognition, in other words, interpersonal cognition, is particulate. Simple mental symbols, in other words, primes, are combined to yield complex mental symbols. Okay. Now, let's move on to a discussion of the null relation. The models are not applied to all human interaction. When a model is not applied to an interaction between persons, this is known as the null relation. Uh, so the null relation is not a fifth model. It's the absence of a model. Okay? Um, now, humans who don't apply any of these moral relational frameworks, they can be very callous, they can be very cruel to other people. They can treat other people as if they were objects, like rocks, or trees, or insects. Nothing more than impediments or obstacles or means to one's material ends. Sociopaths do this. However, normal people under extreme conditions can also behave in this way. When bullets are flying, you may duck behind a rock. You may duck behind a tree. You may duck behind a dead body. You may duck behind a living body. That would be treating a person merely as a means to an end, and that would be the null relation. Now, there is a, uh, just as there is a, uh, <clears throat> a superficial resemblance between equality matching and communal sharing, even though they're, they're really distinct, there's also a superficial resemblance between the null relation and authority ranking, even though they're actually distinct. Um, <clears throat> now, Bertrand Russell, even though he was not familiar with relational models theory, he did illustrate this point in a quote of his from his book, uh, Power, a New Social Analysis, uh, from page 20 of the Rutledge edition, or maybe page 20 of any edition for all I know, but the one I have is Rutledge. Uh, writing back in 1938, Russell described a society in which the relation between ruler and subjects would actually be the null relation, and it's, it's actually uh, quite nightmarish. And here is what Russell said. <clears throat> Imagine a scientific government which, from fear of assassination, lives always in airplanes, except for occasional descents onto landing stages on the summits of high towers or rafts on the sea. Is it likely that such a government will have any profound concern for the happiness of its subjects? Is it not, on the contrary, practically certain that it will view them when all goes well, in the impersonal manner in which it views its machines, but that when anything happens to suggest that after all they're not machines, it will feel the cold rage of men whose axioms are questioned by underlings and will exterminate resistance in whatever manner involves least trouble. 
on the face of it, <clears throat> one might think that that's actually authority ranking. Maybe just a really nasty form of authority ranking. However, there are indicators here that this is not genuinely authority ranking. For one thing, the uh, so-called scientific government has no sense of pastoral obligation to those under its control. As you may recall, part of authority ranking is that the authority has a sense of obligation, of duty, of concern for uh, their inferiors, and you don't find that here at all. It's completely missing. Uh, furthermore, there's no expectation of pastoral concern. Remember, these models are, in the last analysis, psychological. What we're really talking about is what goes on inside of people's minds. It may be that in a brutal dictatorship, the dictator is behaving in a way that shows no concern for their subjects. But even so, there may still be a feeling that the dictator should show a concern for their subjects. But in the sort of society described by Russell, there isn't even a feeling that the rulers should be doing this. No one expects it. Furthermore, no one expects any honor, admiration, or respect to be directed toward the rulers. In actual cases of authority ranking, it may be the case that feelings of respect or admiration are absent. But even so, there's the sense, at least the ironic sense, that they should not be absent, that they should be present. In the sort of society described by Russell, there's no sense at all that there should be any admiration or any respect. No one expects it. They're not ironically absent. They're simply not expected in the first place. So intuitively, the attitude of the uh, so-called scientific gov government described by Russell, um, the attitude of, of that government toward the relationship and the attitudes of those under the government's control they're more like the respective attitudes of a psychopath and the psychopath's victims. They're more like that than the attitudes of, say, king and subject, which would be a clear case of authority ranking. Okay. Now, last time I said something about how there is a mainstream view of social cognition in which cognition, social cognition, is fundamentally person perception. It's thinking about other people and trying to understand how they behave. Now, I want to emphasize that that's not what relational models theory is. Relational models theory is not thinking about other people and how they behave. It's not trying to understand how others behave it is fundamentally thinking about relationships. Okay. Relational models theory is primarily concerned with relations between persons, whereas, whereas on the mainstream view, social cognition is only secondarily concerned with that. Okay. So for example, um, the psychologist Gordon Moskowitz equates social cognition with, and I quote, interpersonal perception. Um, he notes that the main concern of this area of investigation has not varied. In other words, it is analyzing processes of attribution. In other words, attributing properties to other people. An attribution is the end result of a process of classifying and explaining behavior in order to arrive at a decision regarding the reason or cause for the observed behavior. So what Moskowitz is describing is uh, what is sometimes known as folk psychology, and it's also known as theory of mind. 
And what that means is that, um, well, your theory of mind is your capacity to ascribe mental states to others, other people, let's say. So if you explain a person's behavior by ascribing beliefs and desires to that person, then you are exhibiting your theory of mind capacity. You are exercising folk psychology. So let me give you an example. Um, let's say that, um, oh, I don't know. Let's say that your friend Pablo decides to go to college. Well, or let's just say that Pablo goes to college. How do you explain Pablo's going to college? You explain it in terms of beliefs and desires. Pablo, well, I'll use a more familiar, old-fashioned example. Pablo wants a good job, and Pablo believes that the best way to get a good job is first to go to college, or Pablo believes that going to college is necessary for getting a good job. Therefore, Pablo goes to college. That's not exactly a project polymath sort of answer. I guess a project polymath sort of answer would be Pablo wants to um, invent a motor that runs on water. But, okay. but, uh, but you get the idea. Um, in order to explain Pablo's behavior, you attribute beliefs and desires to Pablo. Right? That's a certain kind of person perception known as theory of mind or folk psychology. According to some um, psychologists and ethologists, only human beings exhibit folk psychology. That's a controversy. That makes some people really angry. And they say, oh, that's, that's speciesism. That's not fair to other species. But uh, there is some evidence that has been presented by Daniel Pavanelli. Uh, that's Pavanelli with a P, um, to the effect that among primates, only human beings have theory of mind. And if that's correct, then according to the mainstream view, only human beings exhibit social cognition. However, there is evidence for the relational models, Alan Fisk's relational models, there is evidence for them in other species including other primate species. So when we talk about relational models, we're not talking about folk psychology. We're not talking about theory of mind. We're not talking about looking at the other individual and trying to figure out what they're thinking as a way of explaining what they're doing. We're talking about thinking about the relationship itself. So when you find a dominance hierarchy among baboons, for example, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have theory of mind. It doesn't necessarily mean that the baboons have social psychology. What it means is that they naturally tend to think in terms of certain relations, a relation of ranking. And when you find communal sharing among dolphins, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are ascribing beliefs and desires to each other. Um, maybe they are, but it's quite possible that they don't. But what it does mean is that they recognize certain relations among each other. Right? Um, right, so um, I would now like to discuss some empirical corroboration for the relational models uh, theory. And I also draw your attention to the fact that this corroboration for relational models theory, it's also evidence that thinking about relations is more basic than theory of mind. These psychological studies that I'm about to discuss, they illustrate that theory of mind or folk psychology is itself secondary. It's a derivative. The more basic thing is thinking about relations. And that's consistent with um, evidence adduced by um, Daniel Pavanelli and his colleagues that um, only human beings have theory of mind, but it is not the case that only human beings have social cognition. Social cognition is not basically theory of mind. 
in human beings, theory of mind has been added to social cognition, which is primarily thinking about relations among individuals, right? All right, now let's consider some of this corroboration of relational models theory. Um, some of the tests that were done to uh, test the hypothesis involve accidental name substitution. Um, if you think about it, you'll notice that sometimes you call a person by the wrong name. So you may address Doug as Bill. You may address, you may accidentally address Bill as Susan. That's possible. You might do that. Um, now, what Fisk and his colleagues found through studies is that um, accidental name substitution it tends to fall within a model. In other words, there's a certain elementary model which you predominantly use with a specific person. So with Doug, you very often interact via communal sharing. Um, and with Bill, you also very often interact via communal sharing. And that's why it's easy to get their names mixed up because you have often used the same model in interacting with both of them. That's what Fisk and his colleagues found in their psychological studies. When you get names mixed up, it's usually within a model, not across models. I mean, it is a little bit, but not much. It's usually within a model. Now, the results of their study showed that the relational models are better predictors of these mistakes, these accidental name substitutions, than other ways of categorizing people, such as personality, ethnicity, and age. Only gender was a better predictor than the models. Now what this shows, this is not only evidence that the relational models are psychologically real and they structure how we think, this is also evidence that the relational models structure person perception. Person perception, apart from gender, is primarily <clears throat> uh, interpersonal cognition. It's relational models cognition. Um, now, there are a number of other studies that have been performed. <clears throat> Another study involved person memory errors in which um, one wrongly remembers with whom one did something, and also misdirected actions, for example, in which one performs an action with the wrong person. These were also studied. And um, to avoid cultural bias, a number of these studies were also performed with non-Westerners, including Koreans, Liberians, Bengalis, and Chinese. Um, also, deliberate substitutions were also tested. For example, when you uh, deliberately change your mind as to whom you will do something with. Now, in all of these uh, studies, and also across cultures, the models were consistently the best predictors of outcomes, except for gender. Gender is the one thing that was the, the, the better predictor. But apart from gender, the models were the best predictors. So the models evidently play a large role in person perception. My hunch is that, per, is that the models are basic and that folk psychology is relatively superficial. Right? And so it should not be too surprising that theory of mind or folk psychology is uniquely human. And I don't think that it's uh, speciesism to say so. Um, because the really basic fundamental thing we do share with other species, namely the elementary relational models. Now I mentioned that these um, uh, psychological studies were conducted cross-culturally as well as within cultures. And that, I want to touch briefly on the issue of ethnocentrism or Eurocentrism. Um, it's really not fair 
to say that relational models theory is Eurocentric or ethnocentric, not only because these studies were performed across cultures, but also because Alan Page Fisk was working with the Mose of Burkina Faso when he first formulated relational models theory. Fisk first observed the uh, elementary relational models among the uh, Mose, the African Mose of Burkina Faso. And only later, only afterward, did he find these four models in other cultures, such as his own. He, you know, he lives in the, in the United States, right? Or European culture, or you know, uh, Japanese culture, or, or whatever. Okay. All right, now, uh, continuing with empirical corroboration of relational models theory, and also continuing with um, the, uh, the issue, or the discovery, that person perception itself is fundamentally structured by the relation of models, I would like to consider personality disorders. Um, in the 1950s, the psychologist Timothy Leary devised a way of mapping different types of personalities in terms of a circumplex, which is a uh, circle defined in terms of two axes or two dimensions. Um, dominance versus submission on the one hand, that's the vertical axis, and love versus hate, that's the horizontal axis. Any personality, according to uh, Leary, can be located within this circle, this circumplex. And certain extreme regions of the circle correspond to personality disorders, such as narcissistic personality, um, avoidant personality, sociopathic personality, sadistic personality, and, and whatever. Okay. Um, now, this is an analog system. Of course, Timothy Leary is also famous for something else, but that's, that's a different story. We're not going to get into that. Um, uh, one point I want to make about this circumplex, which, which has been modified through the years, it takes somewhat different forms, but one, one point I want to make about the circumplex is that it's analog. It's a two-dimensional space, and it is a continuous space. It's not digital. It's not broken down into discrete steps. It's continuous, so it's analog. Yeah. Now, um, Nick Haslam, a psychologist who has worked with Alan Page Fisk in testing relational models theory, Haslam noticed that um, personality disorders can also be categorized in terms of the relational models. He also noticed specifically, and here's the quote, several personality disorders that do project onto the circumplex have very similar locations. In other words, they have similar locations within the two-dimensional space of the circumplex. But clinically, they're quite distinct. For instance, narcissistic and paranoid personality disorders share similar locations as do schizoid and avoidant personality disorders. Um, and that's not good news for the circumplex model that indicates that the circumplex model is somehow flawed. That it's, it's not capturing something about the nature of personality. Because schizoid and avoidant personality disorders are really quite different. Uh, schizoid and avoidant people are both non-social, but the schizoid wants to be non-social, and the avoidant person hates being non-social. Right? They're actually just very shy. Yeah. Those two personality disorders should be distinguished. Um, ah, well, here's an updated version of the circumplex. Um, instead of love and hate, you have uh, hostile versus friendly as the um, horizontal axis. The vertical axis is somewhat cut off. On the top should be dominance, and on the bottom should be submission, which is the same as in Leary. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me actually let me go back to um, one of 
Maybe I should get going forward. I'm not sure if Keynote allows me to go back, actually. But um, uh, consider uh, Nick Haslam's first example. He was contrasting narcissistic personality with paranoid personality. Now, Haslam, uh, even though on the circumplex they would not be contrasted. <clears throat> now, Haslam and his colleagues discovered in a controlled study that those with narcissistic personality tend to have a high need for authority ranking. Specifically, the desire to recognize oneself as occupying the high status end of the hierarchy within social interactions. Now, of course, desire and perception are not the same thing. And the narcissist's perception of social interactions is different from what the narcissist actually desires. Right? So, um, in addition to, um, so, I mean, the narcissist wants high authority ranking, but they may not perceive themselves as getting it. Right? Um, the narcissist tends to under-perceive equality matching. So a narcissist tends not to see any need of acting in an egalitarian way, even when other people expect egalitarian treatment. Now the paranoid personality is quite different from a relational model's perspective and also from a clinical perspective, quite different. The paranoid personality was found by Haslam to coincide with a strong need for market pricing. In other words, the paranoid person feels the need to rely on risk assessment and cost-benefit thinking. In their perceptions of social interactions, the paranoid tends to discern authority relations more than most other people authority ranking relations. They tend to over-perceive them. And the paranoid will fail to perceive uh, relations as being structured by communal sharing when other people would perceive them that way. So the paranoid person is far more lacking in sympathy than the narcissist. So from a relational model's perspective, those two personality disorders can be clearly distinguished which is good, they should be clearly distinguished. In the clinical setting, they would be clearly distinguished. But on the circumplex, they're not clearly distinguished. I mean, they're both disagreeable extroverts. No. Um, the circumplex is a blending system. Any personality type is construed as a blending of the two axes. A specific personality is a location within a continuous space, thus implying an analog system. Now, by uh, contrast, uh, Nick Haslam has shown that the relational models can be used to systematize personality types, including the personality disorders, and the resulting model of personality is both digital and analog. It's digital because the models are discrete and it's analog because the reliance on a specific model varies along a continuum. So that's analog because it presupposes a continuous space. And just to uh, reiterate a little bit, a Haslam study showed that abnormal over and under reliance on one or more of the models coincides with various personality disorders. So what all of these studies show is that the relational models enter into person perception, which in turn shows that the mainstream conception of social cognition presupposes interpersonal cognition. In other words, it presupposes cognition of relationships. Relational models theory captures social cognition on a more fundamental level than does the standard conception of social cognition. In fact, if, if the work of Daniel Pavanelli is correct, the standard conception of social cognition does not even capture the social cognition of other species. But relational models theory does, because you do find the elementary models in other species. Okay. Um, so, social cognition 
fundamentally is thinking about relationships. And the term social cognition in the title of this course is not a misnomer, um, even though the course is not primarily concerned with theory of mind or folk psychology. Now, um, there are a few more points I need to make, but I don't have much time now, do I? Let me see how much I can fit in into five minutes. Um, one thing that needs to be explained is variety, and I've already discussed, you know, following William Abler, of course, I've discussed how particulate systems are self-diversifying. They explain greater and greater variety or diversity over time. However, the particulate nature of the relational models is not the only factor that enters into variety. Another factor entering into uh, the, the variety of social uh, relations is implementation. Um, each model needs to be implemented. And earlier, back in the 20th century, the 1990s, Fisk spoke in terms of implementation rules. According to Fisk, rules are necessary for implementing the models. For example, in the case of communal sharing, there is sameness of substance. Well, you need some way of knowing or deciding what counts as the same substance. Is it blood um, for, you know, on, on, a, on a racist form of communal sharing? It might be blood. Right? Uh, is it soul? Like a group of people possess the same soul? Um, in a hunter-gatherer community, a group of people might form a communal sharing group because they believe they share a common soul, especially if they're engaged in a trance ritual or something like that. Um, is it occupation of the same land? Right. Uh, solidarity among Palestinians may have something to do with occupying land or formerly occupying land. Uh, is it love, as in the case of a romantic relationship? Is it a shared history of suffering? I mean, Jewish nationalism, I, I believe, is partly informed by a shared history of great suffering. Is that what it is? But you need some kind of rule to know what counts as same substance. Likewise, for equality matching, in equality matching, one must establish a criterion of sameness in order to determine whether or not each individual or group has been allotted the same thing. You need, you need to know what counts as the same thing. Uh, in authority ranking, people are ranked, but you have to use some criterion for deciding who belongs to which rank. That's implementation. When people buy and sell according to prices, that's one form of market pricing. But um, they have to agree as to what will count as money. Right? I mean, the market pricing model alone does not tell you what the medium for measuring proportion is going to be. That's something that has to be decided. That's implementation. Now, more recently, in the 21st century, Fisk has spoken of prios rather than implementation rules. He's in, in, invented the term prio uh, instead of implementation rule. Perhaps because of some uncertainty as to whether implementation of a model always involves rules in some really strict sense of the word rule. Perhaps one can also include precedents and habits along with rules. So here, quoting from Fisk, these are the four fundamental innate human relational proclivities, he's referring to the elementary models, to signify that they are cognitively modular, that is, that they are discrete, they are particulate, but modifiable that means that they can be implemented in different ways and combined in different ways. Modes of interacting, I call them mods. However, these open-ended generative potentials are insufficient in themselves to determine action or evaluation 
or permit coordination. A mod by itself is purely formal. It's just an abstract structure. It's psychological, but it's abstract in the sense of lacking semantic content. In order to use these mods to act or to interpret others' action, people need socially transmitted prototypes, precedents, and principles that complete the mods, specifying how and when and with respect to whom the mods apply. I use the term prio to signify the class of paradigms, parameters, precepts, prescriptions, propositions, and proscriptions that can be conjoined with mods. A mod must be conjoined with a prio that complements it to generate a specific cultural coordination device. So, um, more recently, Fisk uses the term model to indicate the combination of both a mod and a prio. When I speak of a particular system, I'm talking about the system of mods. Analog elements enter into interpersonal cognition insofar as there are prios. These are points that will be expanded upon as we go along. It's been about an hour now, so let me just wrap things up very quickly. Um, actually, I, uh, I'll talk about some of these things next time. Yeah. Next time I'll start with mods and prios again, so we'll talk about that some more. In the meantime, I want you to read the selection from Fisk's book, The Structures of Social Life. Um, the page numbers are in your syllabus. I'm not asking you to read the entire book, obviously. I posted online the relevant pages. Um, and in that passage that I want you to read from Structures of Social Life, Fisk discusses the particulate nature of interpersonal cognition. He's specifically talking about how models are combined and nested and linked together to form compound complex models, right? Which is the core idea of this course. So I ask you to do that reading and, um, you know, aloha until next time. And if you have any questions, please contact me via email. Thanks.